Welcome to Chapter 6, The Hearing Mechanism. The physiology of the hearing mechanism is essential to understanding many aspects of music behavior. So, basically what this is stating is it's important to understand the hearing process, the parts of the hearing mechanism, in order for us to further explore the semester as far as emotions um, and how music affects that, how our music affects our body. Um, so that's why this is just one of the most foundational chapters, I believe, of the book, and I really enjoy it. And I hope that by the end of this chapter, you'll have a better appreciation of our hearing process and realize how um, important it is to realize hearing health is an important factor that we should all be realizing. So there are elements needed for sound to take place. In order for this to happen, now this is according to your textbook, there are three things. One is a source of vibration. For instance, the source of vibration could be my vocal cords. There has to be a source where it starts. The second thing that is needed is a medium of transmission. Now, going back to chapter 5, we know that a medium, meaning a solid, liquid, or gas, something that the source of vibration, the sound waves, can travel through. And so, in most, in most cases, we can say air. And then finally, the last one is a perceiver, which is someone receiving the source of vibration through the transmission. And now, the way I kind of explain this in class is, think of me talking. There is the vibration of sound. It's traveling through the air, and it's reaching you, the student, and you are the perceiver. All right? And this chapter will discuss the perceiver. So it's important to remember that the hearing mechanism is extremely sensitive and the hearing mechanism is extremely miniature, small and sensitive. Um, I could make a political joke there, but I won't. Um, now, the YouTube clip that is given is um, from the movie Immortal Beloved. And um, there will be a project that you have to do in the next week uh, dealing with the movie and how music plays an important role in it. If Immortal Beloved, after watching this five-minute clip, is something of interest to you, I highly encourage it. It's about Beethoven. And um, although, of course, with movies, there's always the fiction of things that probably didn't happen. But we can say that Beethoven at some, some time or another was deaf in his life. And he actually um, would saw the legs off of his piano and his piano would lay on the floor and he would actually lay on the floor, put his ear against the floor and hear the vibrations through the piano. Really interesting. Um, and so this is just a, a short video clip of um, during a performance of one of his symphonies or concertos and about maybe what he might have heard during that time um, after he had, you know, used, um, had some uh, hearing difficulty. A listener can recognize temporal alterations on a time scale of five milliseconds. That is amazing to me. We are unique human beings and we're very fascinating to know that just any kind of change in time um, on a time scale is of five set milliseconds. So the discussion question that I always have in my class and everyone always wants to argue against me that if a tree falls in the forest and there's no one there to hear it, is there sound? Now, what always ends up happening 
is students are like, well, yes, of course, because there's squirrels or there's animals. And I'm like, okay, so let's just say that there's no squirrels, there's no animals. And sometimes there's still people that are adamant that there still is sound. And then there's some people that are say that, no, there is no sound. So think about it. If you were in the for or sorry, if there was a tree in the forest and it falls and there was no one, no crickets, no insects, no animals, would there be any sound? And the answer to it is no, because going back to what does it take for us, I completely missed that, um, excuse me. The three things that are needed for sound to take place is a source of vibration, which the tree falling, making that noise, a medium of transmission, which you travel through the air, but the perceiver is gone. Once the perceiver is gone, um, the elements needed for sound are not there. So again, there is no sound if a tree falls in the forest and no one there is, is, no one is there to hear it. Again, I'm sure people will argue with me until I'm, you know, six feet under. But that's all right. Discuss the unique contributions hearings make to your inner and outer world. Again, you know, does sound protect you? You know, if you, um, do you hear a bus and maybe you're not looking um, or you hear a car horn go off and you realize that you need to stop and what's going, you know, you're realizing your surroundings. These things are important for you. Um, so the hearing mechanism itself, <coughs> the hearing mechanism itself, there are three areas of um, the hearing mechanism, the outer ear, the middle ear, and the inner ear. The outer ear, um, it, is the part of the hearing process where um, begins a sound pressure waves travel through the atmosphere. So the ear is the first part where the sound wave or sound pressure waves travel through is the outer ear. But think about the structure of the outer ear. What do you notice? And again, it's kind of like a funnel. There are crevices um, and it's used for protection. It's, um, it's important that humans protect their ears and I think probably over millions of years or hundreds of thousands of years, however old we are, our ears have changed. And in order to better suit us, now think about it, animals have muscular control to tilt and rotate them in a different direction. If you ever notice a dog, um, their ears pop up. <clears throat> now, what about what do humans do? To, uh, how do humans do this? And humans, we can't turn our ears or we can't, you know, rotate them to hear where the sound is coming from. We actually have to turn our head, right? So, uh, the outer ear, we're talking about the pina. And the common function of the outer ear or the ear lobe is... Um, is to count, catch sound waves and it helps localize the sound. It helps funnel it down through the ear canal. So from the outer ear um, comes the external auditory meatus, which is the ear canal. So going from the pina to the ear canal, connecting passageways from the outer ear to the middle ear. Now, the Ear canal is filled with air and has hair and sticky wax to keep out unwanted dust particles and other foreign objects. If you ever ask an audiologist, they will tell you to not stick Q-tips in your ears. Um, I've had, I've heard of people actually hitting their eardrum with their Q-tips and damaging their eardrum and busting it and having to go, um, see a specialist to get that fixed it's um, painful and I don't wish that on anybody but once the ear um, once the outer ear receives the sound waves it travels through the ear canal and it hits the eardrum 
I'm sorry, we'll go back. The ear canal function, talking about it, it helps channel the air pressure waves. It controls the temperature and it controls the humidity in the eardrum. If you notice, like if the ears are dry, the humidity is very low, that can also affect your hearing health. So the, the middle ear, the middle ear is between the eardrum and the cochlea. So the, the sound wave has traveled, it's hit your outer ear, your pina, it's traveled through the ear canal, it's now hit the eardrum. It connects with the inner ear by three small bones. So from the hammer, I'm sorry, from the ear canal, it hits the eardrum. From the eardrum, it hits the hammer, hammer, the anvil, and the stirrup. You don't have to know about the malleus, incus, and stapes. Those are the more scientific terms, if you want to call it. But if for any test, just say the hammer, the anvil, and the stirrup. The smallest bones in the body, they're very, very small. The hammer is connected to the eardrum. The anvil is connected to the hammer, and the stirrup is connected to the anvil and the cochlea at the oval window. Now, this is a graphic that, um, a picture that was in your textbook. Um, I will try and make sure I can get that picture up for your test. Um, basically, I in the past, I've just whited it out, and you had to feel the parts of the ear. Um, however, now that this course is on Blackboard, I'm going to try and make sure that um, I either do that or come up with a better creative way of labeling. But again, I, I will let you know. So the sound through the middle ear, the sound wave traveling in the atmosphere reaches the ear, channeled through the ear canal, then to the eardrum. Once the air pressure wave, a uh, sound wave, excuse me, hits the eardrum, the eardrum moves back and forth with the sound wave causing the hammer, the anvil, and the stirrup to move back and forth. We still have not created um, music yet, or sound if you want to call it. It's, the, um, it's still a wave in this form. But when the hammer and the anvil and the stirrup move back and forth, it hits the cochlea at the oval window. Now, the inner ear consists of the semicircular canals and the cochlea. The cochlea is no bigger than the tip of the little finger. It's filled with fluid and they're surrounded with or filled with sensory cells, hair-like cells to give off electrical signals that transfer to the brain. Now, if I was going back to the other picture, you see where the cochlea is located on the far right of the, um, of the picture. And you can see where the hammer, the anvil, and the stirrup are. The stirrup is connected to the cochlea at the semicircular, I'm sorry, at the oval window. And then there's the cochlea. Now you notice the cochlea is round and circular. If we were to lay that flat out, if we were to roll it out, where the stirrup is connected, and we would notice that the highest pitches that we hear as humans are at the beginning of the cochlea. However, the lower sounds, the lower sounds of the um, cochlea are located at the further end of the cochlea. So interesting to know that these hair cells kind of are lined up in order of high pitch to very low. Um, I watched the video. It's a very good process over the hearing process from beginning to the end. Now, just a few things that you need to know about these hair-like cells within the cochlea. When these hair-like cells are damaged, um, you, they never grow back. 
and eventually we will start to get into cochlear implants when we're talking about music and the human person itself or maybe we're talking about music and health you may even get to that part in the documentary that we're going over in class so read through the chapter it's very detailed um, but be prepared to discuss the hearing process from the beginning of when it's a source of vibration all the way to the perceiver and once it finishes the cochlea once the sound waves finish through the cochlea and move those hair like cells that it reaches the auditory nerve which finally goes to the brain in which we finally perceive what we call sound so again sound does not start with just a source of vibration it actually goes further beyond that all right email me with any questions and that's the end of chapter six the hearing mechanism